The gospel lesson comes to us from Matthew chapter 21. The setting for this passage is shortly after Jesus has overturned the money changers' tables and driven the animals out of the temple. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? And Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued one another. If we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. What do you think? A man has two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. And then the father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. Who wants to obey? You know, most of the time, that word obey, if we're honest, kind of turns us off. If we change the question and ask, who wants to talk about other people's disobedience? Now, that's a question we can get into. What gives you the right to break the rules? What makes you think you will be you should be able to get away with things? Why do you get to have an exception? Why, Jesus, do you think it would be okay to overturn the tables in the temple? If it wasn't for that big parade you had into Jerusalem, we would have called in the Romans and had you arrested, thrown in jail, and executed for disturbing the peace. A good portion of the money that moves through here, Jesus, ends up in Roman coffers, you know. We're already going to have to explain to them the loss of today's revenue and make it out of our own pockets. Who told you you could do that? This question of obedience for Christians turns on two very important ideas. We are people freed by God's grace in order that we may obey God's law of love. And we are also people freed by God's grace who are called at times to disobey human ideals and laws to bring freedom and break patterns of injustice. We are called to obey. We are called to radical disobedience. How are we supposed to sort those two out? Who is the authority that we turn to? How can we be like Jesus, faithful to our calling and willing to break out of the human and the sinful bonds that often hem us in? The simple story Jesus told can help us. Two sons. One says yes to the father's command, and one says no. The one who said yes didn't go, and the one who said no did go. The one who answered well and then didn't go, we want to claim we aren't like him. We want to tell ourselves we are another child not mentioned in the parable. You know the one who says yes and goes? That's us, right? But it's not often. Too often we are the ones who say yes and then don't go. We attend worship somewhat rarely. We follow the social conventions of right and wrong. We act polite to our neighbors. We preach and we listen to sermons about sacrifice and accepting those unlike us and tell ourselves this is what we are going to do because we hear the tug of God's spirit 
calling us to labor in the field. And we, then we walk away from that moment where we've heard that tug and we forget about it. We return to our agendas, back to work, back to schlepping the kids around, back to worrying about politics or finances, back to the to-do list, back to school, back to our favorite forms of entertainment. We don't bother to go because everything else crowds it out. And then we return next Sunday for another round of challenge and another round of that would be great and I will get to it very soon, Jesus. You know, when I was in seminary, I was a member of a church whose pastor preached some very powerful sermons. But sometimes they came with a big load of guilt. One of my fellow seminarians who also attended that same church had a theory about how people could tolerate those sermons week after week. He figured people probably enjoyed the cathartic experience of feeling that guilt and then walking away from it. Now, the challenge is, now that we've identified Shirley as worthy of feeling guilty, is not to walk away with here with just a cathartic experience, but a moment that brings us to change. How do we become more like that son who said no, no, and then went anyway? The first step, as Jesus points out, requires some honesty. We have to be honest with ourselves and with each other. Those tax collectors and prostitutes that Jesus cited as getting into heaven ahead of the good religious types understood they were sinners. Society told them so, and they didn't argue with that. They were honest about who they were. We religious types too often tell ourselves we aren't sinners. Oh, maybe a few sins here and there, but not sinner in big capital letters. But sinfulness is not just an act. It's a deep-seated condition of the heart and the mind and the soul. And Jesus knew this and illustrated it powerfully in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, have you lusted? It's just like committing adultery. Have you been really, really angry with someone? Well, it's just like murder. We can extend that list. Have you ever wanted to shade the truth for your own benefit? Well, that's really like false witness. Have you ever really, really wished for something your neighbor has? Well, you might as well have stolen it. When Benita and I lived in um, Ohio, we took a day trip to a part of Ohio that was just west of Wheeling, West Virginia. Benita has a passion for genealogy, and I had some family roots in that direction. We found some grave markers for my second great and third great grandfathers. And while on the road, Benita noticed one, yard, one of her pet peeves in houses. There was a house that we passed by. There was just all sorts of junk cars in the front yard. I told her I thought some of those folks probably wouldn't want to give up those jump cars, even if someone came along and offered to take it off their hands. They might need it someday, is sort of the way their thinking goes. And it occurred to me that those people with junk cars in their yard aren't all that different than some of us who have closets crammed full of stuff that we are saving because we might need it someday, just in case. And it also occurred to me that the folks with junk cars in the yards for all to see, and the folks with closets crammed full are just two of the types of people Jesus was talking about. There are the folks with the junk cars, and the sins are on full display for everybody to see. And then there's those folks whose yards are beautiful, but the closets are crammed full. And their sins, they're carefully hidden away. Just think, if you had donated to the rummage last week, you wouldn't have to be in that second group. <laughs> You know, an honest assessment of sinfulness might bring a person to say, you know what, I'm not going to go work in the field. I can't do it, Jesus. I'm just too broken to be of any good. I'm a rebellious sinner, and I know that, so I think I will just hide here. You know, there's no, none of the, uh, the, the, the no of the verbally dishonest son is at least honest. He brings his sinfulness out into the light of the day. 
out of the hidden places. And something happened to that son who said no. Something changed. There was a moment when he reconsidered. There was a turning around, a repentance. It was likely reluctant, but it was there. And when we're honest with ourselves and with God about our truest desires, even the sinful ones, we give God the chance to respond to our complaints and even our disobedience. Read the Psalms, read the complaints and the objections and the outright criticisms of God that you'll find in the pages of the Psalms. There is so much honesty there. And that's what God wants from us. The son who said, no, I don't really want to go, gave God an honest answer in that moment. The church is asking for volunteers again. I'd really rather not. The church is asking for an increase in giving. Boy, I can't make that kind of sacrifice. Those neighbors of mine look lonely, and I know God wants me to talk to them, but I really, I don't want to do that. I just want to be left alone and not share, and I want to pursue my own agenda. Now, that's an honesty God can work with. Much better than God, I'll start signing up for more things when my schedule gets clear, and I'll give lots more starting soon, and I'll, I'll, I'll invite the neighbors over really soon for a, for a party or for a meal when I've had time to clean the house. I will, I will, I will. You know, we all have a long list of places we know we could do better. We all have plenty of things we probably think I should be doing that. And God doesn't expect them to suddenly, doesn't expect us to suddenly fix all of that. So freely tell God no today while I preach. But then when the sermon is done, make a change. Add something to the offering envelope. Volunteer before you leave the church building to help someplace. Pull out your cell when you get to your car and invite a neighbor to a meal. If a change has to wait till tomorrow because it's at work or school, make it the first thing on your list that you do, not the last. Will any of this be hard? Probably. Jesus was talking about labor. Will it rub you the wrong way? Will there be a sacrifice and make you sweat and make you work more? Probably. But once you open yourselves to doing things that we kick against, amazing things begin to happen. So what does this have to do with the radical obedience or radical disobedience that we were talking about at the beginning of the sermon when it comes to doing things like clearing a temple? When we practice honesty with God, we invite God to change our hearts And we begin to learn true obedience. Each time we obey, despite our complaints and our resistance, we learn a little better how to respond, how to hear and respond to God's voice. And the more we hear God's voice and respond, the more we learn to say yes, even when parts of us wants to say no. And the more radical and daring our obedience to God and our disobedience to the world's standards become. Who wants to obey? Well, at one level, none of us really want to obey. But when we obey God's voice, despite the willfulness that rises within us, God's abundant life takes root in our hearts. And that's an abundant life that leads into the kingdom. And that's an obedience that brings joy. So, Tell God no, and then go and do some work. The work of the kingdom awaits. Labor that changes the lives of other for the better await. Moments where you will find wisdom and strength to shake the world awaits. New life in the kingdom awaits. Amen.